Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this chat uh, with Jonathan Watkins, wonderful Jonathan Watkins. My name is Rob Hasty, I'm Artistic Director of Sheffield Theatres. So uh, I'm going to kick us straight off by uh, just reminding us of uh, the wonderful production that we're all here to talk about. It was before um, before I started at Sheffield, but I, I did see it and uh, I remember it was absolutely beautiful. And, and unlike anything I'd seen before, this is taking us back to 2014 and Jonathan's production of Kez. Since then, Kez reimagined, mm. which uh, brought, which captured that, that beautiful production for a screen. Um, reminded us all, reminded us all of what uh, a wonderful thing it was on the stage. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But can I take us back first of all to the stage production? What was uh, what was your inspiration? What drew you to the Barry Hines novel in the first place? Hi, Rob. Um, hi, everyone. I can't see you, but <laughs> hello. Um, well. It was it was kind of one of those stories that I grew up with, really, and just whether studying at school or hearing someone in my family kind of quoting from the film, or it was kind of like ingrained in like my upbringing, really. So I I think I read it at school, um, and I saw I must have seen the film, um, and I can kind of remember my dad going, "Oh, she was the." Cubs leader, the, the librarian in the film. And, you know, there was that kind of like local connection. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of the start of my being, like being aware of it. But then it was kind of like the time when I was looking to what are the stories that I really am passionate about and, and kind of want to take on as a challenge to try and um, depict through um, like a kind of production like this without words um, and some and it sort of like really over time kind of like germinated and then when I sort of set off and left the Royal Ballet um, as a dancer it was kind of one of those just passionate project at, projects that I wanted to try and um, and realize so I think for me, there were certain elements with this boy and bird relationship that had this kind of poetic nature and there's physicality of like the labor, like the mining kind of industry surrounding it. So there were these like different elements that somehow said to me, this could work. You were a dancer at the Royal Ballet. Yeah. This is this. It's it's quite a long way from sort of classical ballet to telling a story mm -hmm. to get, getting really really narrative driven dance theatre in in a theatre like the Crucible. Um, just tell us a bit about your journey, if you wouldn't mind. Just tell us a bit about about your journey from from dancer to choreographer to director and adapter. Mm. Um. Uh. Well. I'm, I suppose I was, I, was, I was a trained, I went to the Royal Ballet School and, you know, had all these opportunities to create and choreograph at an early age, like with dance. And then when I went into the Royal Ballet Company, I was there for 10 years and it's a great place to kind of learn the traditional way of creating and and what the repertoire is and dancing in that and also kind of you know learning what the tradition is to forget it really um and so when i when i pictured this production of cares i was like i had a kind of vocabulary and a kind of sort of more pedestrian way of how i saw it which doesn't really lend itself to what I think as ballet. So that's where this kind of like hybrid feeling of, well, this is the way I want to tell the story. So how do I match up with a kind of space that will allow me to tell that in a little bit of an unexpected way? Um, and for me, when I ap approached the team at Sheffield, um, it was 
firstly because it was the nearest place to Barnsley that I kind of felt had the scale and scope but also there's the great um, sort of possibilities with the crucible main stage like that kind of wrap around and the diagonals and that kind of expanse of um, the things I'd seen there previously that I thought had worked were I think it's got this great way of kind of feeling intimate but also expansive um, and if you get hopefully the audience in the right kind of way of seeing a production then they're with you on the journey it was like I wanted to develop it within parameters of say like more of a traditional theatre because I didn't want people coming into a building thinking oh this is going to be a ballet in like a proscenium arch because the the vocabulary of ballet can seem a little bit um, unfamiliar and I wanted that familiarity and the movement that kind of pedestrian quality um, so it kind of like like led me there really and thankfully people were passionate about it as well so I'm really I'm also really curious about the, the your relationship with the book and the film were you in touch with uh, uh, how did you prepare were you in touch with uh, the, the Heinz family yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I could never speak to Barry because he was um, like he had severe um, Alzheimer's, like by the time I reached out to um, him. So actually, the correspondence the correspondence was with his wife. But I, I mean, here's the story. And this happens a lot with stuff I do. But my friend, my dad went swimming with someone who knew Barry Hines's wife. So I got that address that way and I wrote her a letter and I, and, uh, I got a reply back saying, you know, your passion sort of jumps off the page and um, ob obviously explaining the circumstances with Barry, but, you know, then the conversations began about, about like what I was going to do and what's this, like, it's not the... Um, play adaptation who you know all those kind of logistical questions started happening with people who look after estates and, and such i love I, I imagine that you're you're way more showbiz but it turns out that that you make connections because you uh people go to the right swimming baths exactly and um i mean there are many different roads to rome or whatever they say but that was just with this one because it very much came from a place of being from there, you know, you know, and sort of a, a like a connection with it that way. So um, I just want, and obviously thinking, I didn't know Barry's situation. So I just wanted to go to the source of this creation. And so um, that's the route I went. Okay, let's, let's, let's go to, let's jump to the, um, uh, the design process. So uh, you work with Ben Stones on the yeah. design, didn't you, who knows the theatre really well. What was what were the sort of what were those early conversations about design for you? Well, I think firstly because um, I'd met, I think I'd met Ben previously, and I really liked his work. But then this little kind of ting went off when I saw he was from Barnsley. So obviously that is not integral to a designer's craft creativity being from the area, but it's that kind of um, basis and foundation that he grew up there, he's from there, he knows the story. And I think the first meeting that we had, I think he said he thought I was going to say something, you know, like, I don't know, like Jane Eyre or something. I don't know, actually. But um and when I said cares, he was just like really surprised. But the thing is that was then our process started building from a place of knowing, of, of knowing those stories of, you know, of family members like coming through the mines, you know, just like I said at the beginning, knowing the story, you know, being part of your DNA sort of thing. Um, so those, the the start of the design was like what I said before was like the expanse and how do you physically and visually tell that story of like these great the great countryside that kind of surrounds Barnsley that's amazing and also these kind of very uh like almost like claustrophobic interior like quite dark and grim sort of uh like location school home etc um, so it kind of came from that and then sort of figuring out 
the puzzle as is with anything, play, ballet, dance, musical, anything. Um, so we just kind of, I mean, I talk a lot, obviously. Um, and me and Ben were just backwards and forwards. And I think Ben sort of discovered this cage-like quality, you know, um, that we then started playing around um, of like creating how those the cages can create and go together to take on different um, locations and what is lovely and what is the challenge with a uh, production that's led through movement is you sort of need that ambition of seamlessness with like how it moves in and out and that these cages become part of the construction of the choreography and and the storytelling and because in the book there is no real description of there's no scene down the mines you know Judd goes off to work and there's a bit of a description but I kind of loved that that Ben came up with that that there was that kind of like physical pushing around that was like that manual labor kind of physicality and that originally at the crucible that Ben did this amazing kind of grass kind of hillside that all the cages came from underneath and out of the earth. And so all of that was just a, like a process of evolution. And, and when, did the, when did you start imagining how the, um, how the bird would, would take physical form? Because I, one of the things that, that I think is so beautiful about um, this story told in that space is, that, is, the, is the use that you make of the, of the air. There's so much air above the crucible stage. And I think um, really successful productions uh, in that theatre um, recognise that with the audience sort of looking, the audience looking down, the, the sort of eye line of the audience is, mm -hmm. is mostly into the sort of the air above the stage. Um, but you can't put anything physical into it because otherwise yeah. you start blocking views on a three-sided space. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a work of genius to kind of carry something sort of has life and and movement through that through that space where, where, where did all those ideas come from so actually that was the first physical um sort of step with the production so i actually myself and rachel canning who designed and made um the puppetry within all the all the things that fly and are animated um we actually had um a, I think it was five days, just me and her, like having a play around. And um, we had a kind of few ideas, but that week was just a very playful experience, like exploring, I think at one point, I've totally forgot this. At one point we had like a giant, like bird head which obviously didn't <laughs> make it through. Like, like Big Bird from Sesame Street music. Um, a bit, but like, because we were obsessed straight away with paper and newspaper because he has a newspaper round at the beginning. So I kind of wanted to try and create the kind of uh, abstract fantasies of the bird world through newspaper. So that was kind of the first part of call. So then what I admired about Rachel's work before was I think I'd seen a production of either Into the Woods or Peter Pan where she'd kind of made like the crocodile in Peter Pan out of um, like some step ladders. And she's, I'd seen loads of some of her work where she kind of repurposed um, things to make objects and animals. And so, and she's just very good at crafting those things. So we sort of set about to discover what can be made with paper and what can be made with, um, actual fabric and then Rachel brought the wonderful the wonderful kites to the to the table which kind of unlocked this sense of you know joy and freedom and and, and at oneness with boy and bird that I just knew that was would be the right place to be at the end of act one which is like Billy and and Kez like at, at one with each other and so it was like we had the boy and bird kite, handheld kite, um, which just was me running around a studio on Friday, like going like this. Um, and we had the, the paper. So for me, the, the, 
uh, narrative of boy and bird and has as the boy and bird become closer the puppetry became more abstract and so we had the beginning and we had the end of like act one so it was how that tracked through to the to the end of like this kind of at oneness with boy and birds you talked about the boy and the bird becoming one talk we talked about the bird talk about the boy this extraordinary performer in fact the whole i mean the whole the whole company um in both incarnations is, is incredible what what was the process of casting these parts different in any way to the usual process of casting dancers or? so when we originally cast it was very much obviously because I'm aware of a lot of performers in the dance world. So it was a kind of mix, mixed approach to many different parts. So um, some of it was just sort of the regular casting, like how you cast a play, especially with Billy, because I started off, I really didn't know like how we were going to approach the age the the we knew the playing age but i didn't know like the actual actor age and how we were to go about that so i went around loads of dance schools i went um to i held auditions we did a long process that had very many different elements um so with billy with chester who plays billy um he I think he was part of like the kind of open auditions for finding Billy. Yes, there he is. Um, he's not changed in like years, I don't think. It's, like, uh, that's inc it's incredible that he was five years after the original, he was able to go yeah, on to I think he's, Not to dispel, dispel the magic, but I think he's about 21 there. 21, 22. And then he was like 26, 27 when we did the film last year. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah, you so, haven't aged a bit either, Jonathan. It's the lighting. Um, so basically, I think he came to one of the auditions, and I was really excited by his physicality, but also his his kind of his the the way that we were working in the auditions was you know working with different because um, I didn't know I'd not choreographed anything I'd not like even really like written it physically so you know we were working out of like elements of oh Billy at school isolated you know very big general broad strokes and Chester kind of seemed to really connect to that not just facially but physically and through his body. So I was, I was kind of excited um, when we met him. But then on the second audition, he came in on, in on crutches. So he came hobbling in on the crutches. So, uh, and he was just like, oh, please, can you still kind of consider me? And I was like, of course. And, you know, obviously we couldn't do anything, but um, I'd seen sort of enough from the times that we had met. So I was uh, really, really just, like blown away with his performance um and what was amazing is revisiting it um and obviously using you know six out of the eight from the original you're obviously you're clicking back in and building on the the things that we discovered from a few years ago but what was incredible is seeing chester's experiences over the five years that we were away from it and what he brought back to it and how he was questioning it differently and through his experiences that he'd had as an actor and as a dancer. And so that was really nice. Um, uh, what did you find the trickiest uh, thing in, in translating cares from the stage to the screen? I, I, I'd sort of imagined you had longer than two weeks, but that's a, that's a huge challenge, isn't it? Well, we had two weeks physically to rehearse. But what the first main challenge was, originally the production was 90 minutes in two halves. Um, and with the, you know, the space and the BBC and they, you know, they have their certain criteria, there was a certain ambition of getting that down to an hour at first, which I was like, I'm not quite sure, you know. So the first challenge logistically was you know looking if you think about it like as a play like looking at it as a play as the physical 
experience that we created at Sheffield and almost like editing that down um but not lo- but not losing any of the main storytelling or you know it was it was kind of really difficult to kind of edit uh the performance and sort of I had to re-choreograph and then relay musically oh we need to kind of adapt this moment um and just a, a, a one little thing that might explain this a little bit more is even when we filmed there's obviously an editing process and there was one scene in the original production which I know sort of through a few people but it is actually in the book and it's where Billy at the end he the, he finds out the bird is is not alive and he goes to this derelict cinema and he dreams about um, the day his dad left, which narratively, dramaturgically is quite a hard thing to say when you can't be like, oh, it's me dad. But um, that we, we went ahead and I really wanted to keep that because I thought cinematically on camera, we could maybe do something that could like, you know, we flash the newspapers and, and like Billy's there looking younger and the mummy's, the, the dad, we can do something with makeup. So that's what we did. And when it was edited, um, a few people we had feedback from and they said like it kind of still threw them. So for the good of the story and the narrative, I had to let that go. That was kind of one of the main challenges because we weren't doing a four camera live. We're just going to run it as live and capture it. And we had like, in a way, the luxury of editing and, you know, kind of trying to focus the story but it obviously did bring challenges because you're not just filming a thing as is you're actually losing 20 minutes but still keeping the story and kill you know still keeping moments and then you're not quite sure what's going to work on camera so you know there's a lot of beautiful description in the novel did that beauty influence your interpretation of the novel in dance did you did the sort of the yeah yeah, I, mean, um, I think that's what the challenge is because it's getting that, it's creating the parameters in order to go into trying to echo that beauty, but also keep the kind of 60s working class Barnsley, like the grittiness to it. So, you know, obviously by, by very nature of dancing, you're overly expressing physically something anyway you know it's not ever going to be realism um so i the moments of beauty that ping out to me are uh, in the book and in the film he delivers his papers and he reads the beano up on the side of the hill um and as he's walking around it's almost like, like when you read it it's almost like nature is showing themselves to him through like something running through the grass and for me, it's a bit like Billy going like this and like seeing like the natural world that's around him and like paying attention to it. So for me, like examining that, it was very much like throwing the paper and then the this imaginative world kind of rushes over him and the, the paper turns into like bird-like things. And then from that, the birds and the nature come around him. So the kind of beauty in that way um came alive came alive in those moments but also again and it's a lot longer subject but music in a production like this is integral it's a character it's a driving force it's a way of writing and so what Alex Baranowski did so amazingly is take us on this journey you know into this uplift euphoric boy and bird theme and you know so there is the kind of like musicality of it which brings some of the elements of the beauty hopefully talk to me a bit more about the music um, because it, it is it is beautiful mm-hmm. and it's so seam- seamlessly woven into the fabric mm-hmm. of the whole um which, which comes first the dance or the music do you do you have this do you have the score Um, ready to go before you start rehearsal or is it does it evolve together so i'll just speak about 
cares because it's different for different things and if you've got a live orchestra or it's recorded or you know you've got a hand in time or people want to feed back on it there are different setups but what happened with cares was um i'd worked with alex twice before on smaller things um but really most of the music comes first and that's where you have to take risks you have to take you have to somehow know like how long things are going to have to be. So that's where it's really difficult. So we would go through scene by scene, bit by bit and sort of work out, you know, what the emotional beats were, like where we were in the story and having got that then thread through themes. So if, like I said, if the boy and Bert, it's good that we're like physically on the thing, but um, if, I'll, I'll be you with the boy. <laughs> no, if, the, if we start here with boy and bird, and so like the boy and bird are here, and then as we go to act, end of act one, it's they're together. Well, that's something that musically you can do. So the theme can start here, and the theme can progress and progress and hit at its absolute heart and core there at the end of act one. So there are different things that we could then look at and weave into that. Barbara says, this was the first time I'd seen older dancers with lived-in bodies in performance um, and surprising to see that it was surprising to see them as dancers with such great agility. How, talk to us about, old, about the lifespan of a, of a dancer. I mean, Barbara's question is, can older dancers make a living solely from dance? Well, yeah. So um, I think um, in the production, you're f referring probably to Anton, who plays the headmaster mainly, and Phil, who plays the um, PE teacher. Um, those those guys, um, these performers are not just strictly dancers, so they're kind of able to work across all different platforms and different things. Um, for me, I absolutely love it. And I think that is hopefully what worked in CARES because people see people of all ages and all sizes. And that is hopefully what we want to see on our stages. We want to see stages that are filled with reflecting physically what we look as a society as, you know, it, it, it really, really helps for like empathy and, and it helps to kind of take, for example, the working men's club scene where they're all getting drunk. You know, as soon as you see those kind of bodies like moving and because of that pedestrian quality that I was talking about, if, you're, if they're performing a pedestrian like movement, you can suddenly go, oh, I've been there Saturday night in a pub drunk I'm like, you know, obviously you're not articulating fully, but you, maybe your own movements are a little bit more swayy. I don't know if that's a word, swayy. Um, but it kind of, it's just, it's just the kind of authenticity of movement, I think, comes from different bodies. And for example, I loved that Phil may have had some restrictions because of his physique, but there, they, those restrictions created the kind of authenticity, really. Leading on from that, get a, a question from Gary. Did the, did the people of uh, Barnsley and Hoyland approve of the characterizations of the dance? Have you spoken to, like, I mean, did, did, did your family come and see it? Did, did, did they recognize, uh, is there a particular characterization of those, those roles that felt very true to people from, from where I it's? Mean, let's be real like it's a dance production so like it's it's a it's it's a heightened characterization of these characters that are in a book that are also written by someone that is then also a kind of characterization of what he thinks so um i think i mean loads of different people um sorry obviously it's not the book it's not the film but it's if you accept i think a lot of people accepted the way that the story was told and could see um reflections of different people that they knew and you know like i said working men's club bookies you know all of that you don't see people dancing in a bookies but you can sort of relate to the kind of 
maybe physicality or or, or way of um, sort of like the atmosphere of it really. I think it's hard when you're adapting something because you're not saying I am doing this and I am hoping to cancel out the film and cancel out the book. You're you're doing you're like extrapolating it from those mediums and sort of telling it in a new way to hopefully uncover a different way of seeing it, but it's in honor of it and it's inspired by it and it's in addition to it. Saray has asked a question, whether the experience of doing CARES changed any of your practice in any way or kind of inspired you in, for, in future projects? Yeah, completely hard because um, for me as a creative, as an artist, as, you know, ever evolving hopefully and being challenged, Kez was kind of the first production that I was able to say, this is me, this is like more me, this is like my artistic kind of vision of this story. And so I was able to kind of take away from that, like not just the process of collaborating or challenges or working with a dramaturg or how to tell a story without words or, but you can take that and apply it to absolutely everything because the way in I, I approached cares, there are similarities in the way that we approach reasons to stay alive. Obviously there was that element of people speaking, but there was still an exploration of, what those words mean because cares was directly lifted from what is written in the book. So we still explored um, what was said, what the character was developing, what they were doing in this scene or that scene. But it was obviously then trying to add on and create a way of showing that. But um, the way that I approach projects is how does this idea need to be shared mm. um, and I think you only really get that by experience and gaining hopefully creative confidence. Thank you for speaking to us. I'm going to finish by just um, uh, sharing uh, a comment from uh, from Karen who's been watching. Of nearly 30 years enjoying Sheffield theatres, Kez was the most moving show I've ever seen with tears of amazement streaming down my face in the interval before and before the talkback session. Being my first experience of the story, it led me to the book and the film and to last year meeting Di Bradley, who showed as much connection as I'd hoped. So thank you for your wonderful interpretation of this local story. I think oh. she speaks for us there. Thank you very much, Jonathan. You left a lasting legacy with that production. I'm glad, I'm so pleased that it stayed, that, that we can still see it, that you found mm. a way to make it indelible, um, uh, which not all theatre can, can achieve. Um, thank you for those words um, that you just read out. That was mo that was really really nice to hear. Thanks so much, and I'm just happy to be able to share it with as many people who want to watch it. It's a very special one. In the, thank, in lots you. Of thank, thank you very you. much for staying with us. You're uh, welcome, and hope to see everyone in a room at some point soon. You know. <laughs>